Anna Maria. And yeah, thanks for inviting. It's nice to be here. I was already here last week, meeting many nice people, having good discussions. Uh, it's a really lovely place. And after three years of not really traveling much and not being in the United States for a long time, I really appreciate to connect to this community again. So today I would like to report a bit about uh, the type of experiments we're doing at PTB, the German National Metrology Institute. So you're welcome to visit us in Braunschweig. Some of uh, you here already did, others didn't. So please come and see us. We are located in Maria Göppert Meyer building. Um, and this is the team. So we also have a vivid exchange uh, between Osaka, where I'm guest professor, and also Tokyo, the NICT, where they're also doing an indium iron clock. So we have always a very nice exchange. Um, so uh, our group actually consists of five different teams. Um, from very technological uh, applications and uh, working with industry, with Infineon, and doing really what we are supposed to do at PTB, standardization of quantum technologies. Don't worry, I will not talk about this here. <laughs> uh, ranging to the other side of the rainbow to very wild fundamental uh, tests of physics and uh, yeah, working on a new generation of, uh, of clocks. Actually, in November, I will also come back uh, for this part. There's another KITP meeting on long-range interactions, so I will not touch really on this. But that was a natural outcome since we, are, we wanted to build a multi-iron clock system in 2010. And then when you have to deal with such a complex nonlinear system, you just naturally start studying the dynamics of these things. Yeah, and this is really like you can build your own little solid state system atom by atom. I think this is what got me excited about trapping ions. Uh, I, I work with neutral atoms uh, a, a lot before, with neutral francium, magnesium, and rubidium, and only very late after my postdoc, I changed to the ions. And here you have really immediate the single atom resolution where you can see atom by atom in this lattice sites. It's beautiful, you have a single ion control. Um, and yeah, we, we can do the 1D, 2D, 3D systems, and the 1D systems with one millikelvin Kelvin roughly, uh, just at the Doppler cooling. And it's a very nonlinear self-organized system with back action. And that got us interested, and we did a lot of stuff in phase transitions, topological defect, studying nanofrictions, how these atoms are uh, moving uh, on top of each other, studying energy transport through uh, topological defects and King solitons. But again, that would be a completely talk I could talk uh, for 45 minutes about. So uh, this will be actually a session in November. But just to tell you, we're trying to get these beasts under our best level of control and to open them up for precision spectroscopy. Well, now I will focus on a part of precision spectroscopy. This is the part of this talk in your monitor room, I, uh, and, and also the search for new physics. So why did we start out with multi-ion clocks? You know, when I switched from neutral atoms to ions, I was left over with a single atom. So now we're completely switching gears, going to a completely different regime than what you heard in the first two uh, session, uh, in the first two talks of the session. And uh, actually, I came from gravimetry. So that was the gravimeter I built during my postdoc time in Paris, where we're dropping rubidium atoms, uh, measuring little g. So uh, I was a lot in contact with geodesists, and I was always intrigued by this idea that with clocks, we could also measure the gravitational redshift. And I'm very thankful to uh, Shimon that he introduced it so nicely. Uh, it's a perfect basis uh, for this talk. So that was also my motivation, yeah? I wanted to bring the clocks out onto the mountains and to the fields and do relativistic geodesy with it. And actually, there's a very intriguing, interesting puzzle that, uh, uh, due to global warming, unfortunately, not only the glaciers are melting away, uh, also the mountains are getting uh, unstable. And the permafrost is diminishing, so it's subsidizing. And probably what we see in the Alps uh, is that the summits are shrinking by one or two centimeters per year. But that's really not resolvable. Uh, because if you put your gravimeter here, you're very local, uh, uh, sensitive to local mass changes. You're measuring little g, which is sensitive to 1 over r squared. So you're very sensitive to the local snow cover changes, to precipitation, the hydrology, groundwater tables. Uh, but you're completely drowning in this noise, and you don't really see the change in geo uh, potential height. Uh, this is what we elaborated here uh, in, in this review. So I will not go in detail here, but that was a, a motivation. And also when you see about uh, the uncertainties what we have had uh, discovered in Europe about the height system that was measured with gravimeters, uh, this is then uh, when NASA and ESA were flying the Goche and GRACE satellites. You see some very huge uncertainties from the north of Sweden down to the south of Sicily. There were um, yeah, uncertainties plus minus half a meter, so more than a meter uncertainty. 
And it has been already proposed in the 1970s that clocks could come in as a basically a general relativity sensor to, to measure these height differences and to give us very nice permanent height references. Nowadays, we can span all Europe with a, a fiber network. We connect our clocks in, in big networks and we have them constantly running. So we can observe also mass changes because the planet is of course not a solid uh, constant body. So that was what drove me when I switched to the ions and wanted to make some of the best clocks in the world. Uh, and yeah, just for fun, during the COVID lockdown, when we had time, uh, we teamed up with the NIST and Fermilab to make a, a fun movie uh, that was seen many times all about time dilation. So in particular, uh, emotional time dilation, how time slows down close to the black hole, because our iron clocks are really limited by time dilation. This is one of the big concerns that we're dealing with. Um, also the gravitational aspect you see here. Okay, now why iron clocks? Why did I switch and try something new? Well, I, I guess I was intrigued by this high level of control that we're having over the single atomic systems. Yeah, so uh, we're trapping ions in such classical traps. This is uh, how I started working with ions at PPB. You have the shaking condromotive potential, and if you take the time average, you get an incredible deep potential. It's the most perfect harmonic oscillator you can think of, yeah? Because it has a depth of 10 thousandths of Kelvin. Mm -hmm. So it's really very harmonic, uh, very good approximation. And we can cool the ions there, prepare them uh, close to the motion, uh, gro quantum mechanical ground state of motion, where the wave function uh, is about 10 nanometers. So uh, we know very well the magnet, we can characterize it well here, the magnetic field, electric fields. The electric field itself is zero, so we don't have a first order shifts at all. We don't have to work at a, a magic uh, wavelength or so. It's really first order uh, shift free. Uh, and then uh, the very deep trapping potential also gives you very long trapping lifetimes. Like the single atrium ions, we can store for several months into an hour system without losing them. That gives us a very high duty cycle. And we don't, at the moment, not worry about the dick effect, the aliasing. Maybe in the future, multi-ion clocks we will, uh, because there the stability will be so good that we also have to think about the dick effect again. Well, uh, and last but not least, I think uh, that's what intrigued me. I think these physics packages, we will make them very compact and very robust because the ions are trapped in such a deep lattice, uh, in such a deep trap. So I really want to bring it out on a mountain. And well, it's a head-to-head -head race, as we have seen also in June's talk. Uh, so 10 to minus 18, that's the magic number. And well, the iron clock uh, at the NIST, the aluminum quantum logic clock, just broke this limit with 9.4, 10 to minus 19. Uh, so this is where we're going. Um, but this is all about accuracy. And just to remind you also what micromotion is, because I will come back later in our measurements, this is something really nasty you have in RF iron traps because you shake your potential before uh, when you do the time average. And you see just uh, at the nodal line, uh, the ions really don't feel anything of the shaking of the potential of the, of the iron trap potential. And if as soon as they leave this uh, node, be it just by thermal excitation, if you have residual temperature, you see this uh, micro motion and it can be, give you a, a lot of uh, kinetic energy and thus a high time dilation shift. So we really worry about time uh, about this. Uh, and I'm sorry, I will stay very superficial in my talk because of limited time, I will, uh, but if you have questions, I'm happy to discuss. Well, anyway, but for this very high level of control of this uh, single ions and this perfect harmonic oscillators where you can manipulate the pseudo spin and the, um, the, the bosonic degree of freedom, the motion with help of laser beams, yeah, uh, doing red and blue sidebands, uh, quantum gates, uh, for this groundbreaking method, Dave Weinland was awarded that allowed him to manipulate measure the single quantum systems. And nowadays, we're trying to scale them up for quantum computers. Uh, we have the world record in coherence time. But this is really what gives us this very high accuracy, but always over yeah, for, I, for iron clocks, unfortunately, a single iron. Now we come to the stability, and thanks also to Shimon, he introduced it very nicely. That is really the problem. Yeah, if you look at the uh, some of the best iron clocks in the world. At one second averaging time, you have a resolution of the low 10 to minus 15 level in a second. And then if you, uh, this is really limited by quantum projection noise because we have no dick effect. But then if you want to break this 10 to minus 18 limit and go to the 10 to minus 19, we have to be so patient. We have to average for tens to hundreds of days and nobody really can do or wants to do this. Uh, so this is really when I moved to PDB working on ions, I said, how can I improve that? How can I push it down? Uh, what are the numbers here? Well, 
the most natural thing is you crank up the number of atoms. There people laugh at you and say, no, you will run out of the lambda regime, you have too much nonlinear interaction, but we will see how far we can push it. Uh, the other obvious choice is you crank up the frequency, that helps naturally. So with indium, we're already working at 230 nanometer. This is doable now with lasers. Maybe in the future, when technology evolves, we can find uh, even better transitions in the thorium uh, iron clock, for instance, 150 nanometer. But well, this is a lot of technical effort. Then if I just uh, improve on the resolved line width, going to longer and longer uh, um, measurement times, then actually uh, it will also limit my cycle time because uh, this is Fourier limit. So if I put that here, you see the interrogation time goes directly under the square root cancels. Uh, so actually I only win with the square root. I don't win linearly anymore as I think I do here with the quality factor. Uh, but since basically you can say the interrogation time is then equal to your cycle time, you win in the same way as improving the ions. And that's why I think we have to improve both. We have to work on a number of ions and we have to, of course, push the interrogation time. But both knobs have equal impact on our clocks. And last but not least, if I'm thinking of my clock on a mountain where probably I will not carry with me a cryogenic silicon cavity, um, uh, but also it's really lovely if you have many ions, uh, you can also lock much faster onto the atomic signal. So in a certain way, also the requirements of the clock laser are relaxed depending on the applications. Maybe on the mountain, I don't need a 10 to minus 21 clock, uh, but then really for portable complex devices, maybe also space clocks, I think this is a very good way to go. Compact, uh, but with relaxed requirements. Well, so this is how we started out with our multi-ion approach. We published that in Applied Physics B in 2012, and we proposed that now we would love to have uh, new uh, methods that allow us to manipulate and measure many body quantum systems, scale it up to a whole string, maybe in the future two-dimensional arrays of many, many ions, uh, and use them for precision methodology. And if we have that under a good level of control, classically first, then of course we also can dream of entangling them, squeezing them, maybe trying the Heisenberg limit, using multi-ensemble clocks, going for one over tau scaling where we have cascaded approaches. Actually, our approach in the beginning immediately was always we want to build a multi-ensemble clock. So the iron traps that we developed at PTB were always uh, targeted to have many different clocks scalable in a single iron trap setup so that we in the future have really multi-ensemble clock operation uh, where we eventually also can go to a cascaded regime, pre-stabilize the laser on one ensemble and then push uh, further the interrogation time. Well, and uh, I was very, it's very nice to see that uh, since 2012, uh, a few more groups are now following also up on this multi-ion approach uh, because people get uh, tired, I think, of waiting and averaging. So there are more and more uh, ions that are on the way in progress and also have been proposed for this multi-ion approach. So I'm very excited to see how we're doing then. And uh, yeah, but why did nobody do it? Was really the challenge because probably you will look at me and think, come on, 10 ions, that's so little, that's ridiculous. <laughs> why is nobody doing it? So uh, when I started it, I did a systematic analysis of what are the problems, how can we solve it? Uh, I would like to first maybe start with the lower two, quadrupole shift, that's an intrinsic atomic property and the many body system. Well, if you have an ion system, you have intrinsic long-range interaction, yeah? So you always have a coupled system where the ions talk to each other. And that gives rise to phonons. Uh, so you see a picture that we took from a common mode, the breathing mode, uh, the Egyptian mode, out of phase. And uh, you have to cool all the phonons and you have to be sure that you have a control over this collective motion. If you have n ions, you have three times n of these phonons that you have to control. And we started, for instance, uh, the, the cooling of these phonons. Yeah? When you prepare the system in a quantum mechanical ground state, uh, you always have some anomalous heating. The ion will leave it without you wanting it, but you, well, the ions are charged, so they interact with stray fields, with any absorbance on ion traps, with just any electron sitting on the vacuum window. And uh, so typically you see one over F noise uh, scaling. And uh, the nice thing is, if everything is clean, the Common modes typically see some heating rate, uh, but uh, the other modes that break us the symmetry that are basically with nodes and stretched, they're really strongly uh, suppressed because of uh, symmetry arguments, because the noise is typically rather homogeneous, so it's not heating up the other phonons. 
But uh, that's not the full story. If you have gradients in micromotion, which you always do because the ion trap is not infinite, so a capacitor at a finite size has some gradients and the electric field buckles off, you do see suddenly very strong heating because the micromotion gradient couples now into the secular motion and heats the phonons. And we studied that uh, very thoroughly, like here in a very simple ion, a two ion system I would like to just explain you. Uh, so if you have like, uh, it really depends on emotional mode you look like at. Is it like a common mode where ions move uh, in, uh, together, so you need a homogeneous electric field? Uh, or if the ions are moving out of phase, then you're looking really at the gradients, so this is then heated stronger. So you have to really be careful about the different emotional modes, how they're really uh, heated in such a complex system. And we, we did this in a, uh, this nice paper of Dimitri Kalinchev I had here in 2021 where we really looked at the different configurations, 1D, 2D, and 3D, and, and seeing how well we can control time dilation in these systems. And with our iron trap, which is really engineered to have low time dilation, uh, it, it's fortunately at the low level, but still something on the order of 10 to minus 18 per second. Well, the other thing is the intrinsic property of the atom. So how spherical is my atom, uh, electronic orbit? Uh, if I'm... Um, if I have a D shell, for instance, I do have a quadrupole deformation, a quadrupole um, momentum. And this um, quadrupole moment interacts with any electric field gradient and gives you what we call electric quadrupole shift. And you see in ion traps, you always have field gradients. You're sitting at the potential minimum, electric field is zero, but of course there's a curvature of the potential, so you have electric field gradient. And if you put many ions, you even have stronger field gradients, even in homogeneous ones. So uh, one thing is you could cancel it because you see there's a magic angle depending what I choose beta, it's ar around uh, 54 degree uh, between uh, the electric field gradient and the uh, quantization axis. I could in principle get rid of the quadrupole shift, but then uh, the uncertainty is highest because you're really sitting at the slope, uh, you know, how it scales. So our easy approach for beginners, because we wanted to make it as easy as possible for a first prototype of multi-ion clock, uh, we were choosing actually a special type of ions, uh, well with aluminum, indium, and also ytterbium you can do it because they intrinsically have a very small quadrupole moment. So we don't have to care about it at all in the, in the beginning, at least not at the 10 to minus 20 level. And uh, the reason why they have it is because they have J uh, smaller than one half, so they have very spherical electron orbits without quadrupole moment. And actually, these are the two types where, which we were choosing in the beginning to make an easy kind of uh, multi-ion clock. We love heavy ions. Heavy ions give you a very low time dilation, not like magnesium, where I worked on in my PhD thesis. <laughs> um, so indium, for instance, is a very uh, heavy ion. It has, uh, at, if you just cool it at the Doppler limit, so no ground state cooling, you already end up at a time dilation shift of 10 to minus 18. That's wonderful. Super simple and really controllable. A black body radiation shift is one of the lowest you can imagine. So Mariana calculated and estimated it for us uh, nicely. Uh, it's one times 10 to minus 17 at room temperature because all the transitions are also pretty much in the deep UV. The second order Seyman shift is also the lowest one you can imagine because we have such a high fine structure splitting here. So we don't really, we're not very sensitive of uh, asymmetric currents in our ion trap. This is extremely low. And last but not least, even more powerful, we have a direct detectable uh, transition from the intercombination line triplet P1 to singlet S0, where we can do a second stage cooling and also direct detection, uh, which makes it very scalable, so avoiding quantum logic. That's why we thought for the beginning, for the proof of principle, we will choose indium to make the first multi-ion clock in the world. Later on, we can also switch to terbium. I will show you in a second, because there, of course, we can push the lifetime. Um, but in the beginning, we thought, okay, indium it is because of this ridiculously low quadrupole moment and, and very good uh, features where we don't have to care much. But since uh, indium cannot be cooled directly on this line, there's no laser, uh, we choose from the beginning on to have some sympathetic cooling with the terbium ion because if you have a very long crystals, you need more cooling power. You have all this nonlinear chaotic uh, cooler interaction, so we want a lot of cooling power. So these are our two candidates, indium and ytterbium. And since we have ytterbium, of course, we also use it for fun stuff. You will see later on for the search of physic, uh, new physics. It has uh, uh, quadrupole transitions, it has octopole transitions, very forbidden transitions. 
And there uh, we can do also very interesting precision spectroscopy like the LLI test was done here, isotope shifts. Uh, and we also use the terbium to really benchmark and characterize the whole ion trap because it's the easier atom, everything moderate uh, wavelength. Okay, and the rest that remains now of the challenges here is very technical actually. Uh, when I studied why nobody scaled up their uh, ions so far, it was actually a lot to do with on-axis micromotion, anomalous heating, the warming of the trap itself that got temperatures of 150 degrees uh, Celsius, inhomogeneities in magnetic fields and all other gradients. So it's all trap related and that's why when we started at PDB, we thought we first better uh, build a very good ion trap to have a good basis and then try the clock. So we have a nice clean room center, we had femtosecond or nanosecond lasers in the beginning. So we designed our ion traps ourselves, we kept uh, as many symmetries as possible to have really no micromotion, so everything was done with finite element uh, simulations. And I will not go into the technical engineering part, but it worked well and so far we're also supplying others in Amsterdam and Linz, uh, also uh, the, um, the terbium ion clock of Niels Huntemann is operating with our traps now, DLR. So there are many things and we also outsourced it to a company that put it on the market that was just recently shipped to the US, so you can also buy the straps now. But okay, that's uh, boring engineering maybe for you. Uh, in the future, just to tell you, we also switch now to nanophotonics because uh, in, I mean, in this first type of trap that we built here, you see you can put a few tens of iron, maybe 50 irons, yeah, maybe 70. Uh, but if I really want to have the true scalability and I'm thinking of thousands of ions, then I have to go to two-dimensional arrays and we, have, we share the same problems like any quantum computer person has uh, working with uh, ion qubits. So you want to have your light delivery and detection directly integrated into the ion traps. And that would be another talk uh, I could give, but uh, we're working on this. We already have received the first ion traps from Lionix. We collaborate with Karan Meta there. So this is what we're doing now. We also have uh, big industry partners like Infineon that help us with integrated detection. But as you can imagine, this is nothing where we'll, what I will show you the results in two years. That's a long-term perspective. But thousands of ions, that's what we want to have. And then if you squeeze it, maybe we ever be competitive with, uh, with June's uh, goals. We have to see. <laughs> so the ion trap was benchmarked um, for the warming, the heating, the micromotion, the, the anomalous heating rate. Lots of things I will not tell you now. I think that one of the interesting aspects was really how is time in such a linear system when you consider micromotion? This kinetic energy that comes with the tickle of the RF, does it really vanish? Because if you're a metrologist, you have to question everything. And so first we had to study micromotion very carefully. Um, we had to first come up with a new method how to measure and benchmark micromotion because we realized the old model from 98 was unfortunately not working for any ion uh, except uh, mercury um, because you really have to consider the interference of the electric field, the coherence of the ions. We first uh, worked on a new model to measure micromotion with phonon correlation. Then we used this model and we measured micromotion in such an extended cooler crystal over 400 micrometer. And you really see, I mean, this is a bad animation, sorry. This is a 3D animation of uh, a graphic of the motion of each atom individually resolved and how it moves. And this bar is here the, the scale of one nanometer. So you can really see the amplitude of this tiny micromotion at nanometer amplitudes, atom by atom resolved. And that means that every atom in your cooler system actually sees a different time or feels a different time, right? Mm -hmm. And this is what uh, is important for us. And um, maybe this will sound now disappointing for you because the, the time dilation in our ion trap over 400 micrometer scale is below 10 to minus 19. But if you uh, take a, a regular trap, um, actually it can be 10 to minus 17 over just five micrometer. So then these slopes would be so deep. And that was for us actually the reason why we engineered these traps to make it orders of magnitude lower. If you take, if you just buy a, a simple blade trap or so, you have orders of magnitude larger time dilation shifts and in homogeneities. So that was for us a very important benchmark in 2019. And wrapping up all these measurements that we had uh, collected, oh, thank you, over uh, many, many years, uh, we then uh, published our first estimated error budget of such a multi-ion clock. And we could show that all the systematic shifts are really in the low 10 to minus 19 level. And if we do the direct cooling on indium, what we're up to do soon, we can probably even push it to the 10 to minus 20. 
but this is an estimated error budget, and how do I know if my clock is correct? I have to measure against other clocks. And uh, so far, we never had a dedicated experiment, unfortunately, for our clock setup. So old, very late in, 2019, uh, in 2018, we started setting up a dedicated titanium chamber with one of the nice iron traps just for the clock spectroscopy. We have direct image uh, detection of indium and ytterbium. Indium is pink, uh, ytterbium is blue here in this. So we, can, we have this perfect atomic resolution. Then we uh, participated uh, in our first runs already in such an uh, international frequency measurement campaign with the INRIM in Torino, France, uh, the CERP in Paris, and of course a local three-corner head measurement. And that was very nice to see that this is the indium strontium ratio as it was published in 2020 by the NICT. And our first run already brought us two orders of magnitude below that resolution. Here we still had a bump. You see something was going wrong at long time scales. But then when we improved this, we could demonstrate that we're really now averaging down to 3 times 10 to minus 18 without any deviation. It's a really flat uh, add of scaling down. And in terms of the error budget, uh, well, this is still a uh, wait for the 10 to minus 19 to come because we made many silly mistakes, like the ser servo error was badly predicted, so you have to uh, deal with many technical issues. So this uh, contribution will vanish completely in the future. Um, so what we're hitting ground now is actually the unknown polarizability, uh, which has not been measured. Um, we have to do it in the future. Also, the chiromagnetic ratio, uh, ratio of the uh, clock state is not uh, known. We have to measure it. That's not a big deal. So at the moment, we claim to have an uncertainty of 2.4, 10 to minus 18. But the reproducibility that we think we have now is actually 6 times 10 to minus 19, because things like the polarizability is an atomic constant and will not change in time. And the temperature we control well enough. Uh, and in the future, we really want to hit now the 4 times 10 to minus 19 with the second stage cooling. And, well, in terms of mighty iron aspects, uh, I will report to this next year, but uh, exactly when we wanted to measure against the strontium lattice clock, the oven went empty, the strontium oven was empty. So I, I don't have this data here, <laughs> uh, so I hope to show you next year. But we're on the way, and at least I can tell you at the level of 10 to minus 17, we have not seen any, anything suspicious for the mighty iron approach. And the nice thing is, as an uh, outlook and perspective, also ytterbium is a cool candidate. So here we have already excited eight ytterbium ions on, on the very forbidden octopole transition with 1.6 year lifetime. Uh, and also the, uh, uh, the quarterpole moment is actually very low in octopole. So if you look at this on an homogeneities, you see that a clock with 10 to minus 19 systematic uh, uncertainty is possible. And of course, in reproducibility even more because these shifts are very stable in time at the 10 to minus 5 level. Well, now I'm sorry I'm overshooting time. Just a very short outlook for a discussion later on. Uh, we also use the turbium now because we have it for a, a most stringent test of local Lorentz invariance. You've seen it in uh, the talk before. Uh, one of the important pillars of Einstein's equivalence principle. And actually, uh, what uh, people have switched now doing is from classical uh, michelson morley interferometers to atom interferometers, that you basically take electron orbits that are orthogonal or very different in space, and you lazily sit on your planet, wait until you're rotating around yourself in a sidereal day, so 23 hours and 56 minutes. And, uh, okay, so I will skip these things. It's, what I just want to show you, it's, it's a tensorial shift. If you have a, um, a violation, a, a Hamiltonian a contribution to a possible symmetry breaking. And uh, ytterbium is actually, if you look at this tensorial uh, matrix element, it's uh, at the moment the most uh, sensitive one because the ytterbium has this very uh, low-lying F uh, shell, which uh, is close to the nucleus and very relativistic, so you get the highest sensitivity there. But the problem is, if you want to measure this matrix element, you have to deal with magnetic Seeman substates that are first order Seeman sensitive, and that's terrible. So we want to prepare this uh, pseudo spin up here in the F state, and then do Ramsey spectroscopy on the magnetic uh, Seeman manifold here. But we have to first stabilize the magnetic field to the nanotesla level. Here we got the first rubby flops to really excite it on a Seeman uh, allowed transition. Then, uh, to uh, improve and, and kill all magnetic residuals, we had to do a composite uh, Ramsey uh, sequence here on the block sphere. Not a, a regular spin echo is not enough. You really have to do many, many pulses on your block sphere 
to extend uh, the dark time up to seconds. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, so we have to, in order to, initially we had a, a, um, a, a dark time of milliseconds if you don't do anything because this magnetic Seemann substrates decohere immediately. But if you do this composite uh, Ramsey type scheme, then you extend it uh, to uh, 10,000 times larger. And uh, this is actually showing you the fidelity that we got with this UR10 sequence compared to a general spin echo. So using that scheme, uh, we have then uh, measured uh, time dilation sitting here on the slope where you have the highest sensitivity, where this tensorial moment would change over time. And voila, we did the measurement over five weeks with a very high sensitivity. The nice thing is you have some noise, but you're really looking in a Fourier decomposition only for the sidereal day and, and twice its frequency. And then we measure down uh, to sub milliradian. And we could really push down in the electron photon sector to a new world record. So all these uh, components in the Kostoletsky uh, model of the. Uh, yeah. Uh, they are now in a 10 to minus 21 region. And the nice thing is with this uh, new type of that dynamic decoupling scheme, we were actually nine times faster than what has been shown previously with uh, operational running clocks. So that was a nice uh, experiment by Christian Sanner. Uh, but since we did it in this different way, we don't need a clock uh, operating and we're really nine times faster. So this is a really nice scheme that we published end of this year. And because we had the uh, um, isotopes anyway, we had the uh, even isotopes of ytterbium, we have many. We also did immediately the isotope shift measurements and pushed uh, Vladan's bounds by a factor of 100 down. Uh, and now we're evaluating this. So this will be published soon, new bounds uh, to come. Uh, and of course, with this, we're looking for fifth forces. I'm happy to discuss it with you. Elena will also be here. Uh, but of course, we're struggling right now with all these. I have to learn nuclear physics now, so we're collaborating now with the GSI guys. And now I'm at the end of the talk. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> Thank you for the very nice talk. Um, we are open to for questions. You. Um, can I ask the two questions? Sure, sure. <laughs> the, the, the first one concerns the you know, I saw in the Euro budget, the biggest one is the time dilation by the thermal, and this is 1.6 times 10 minus 18. Presumably by laser cooling, you can get better, much yes. better. But then you, in the previous slide, you showed the micro motion in the ion chain. Each ion, you're doing atomic resolved micro motion, and these, they all have different sort of emotional states. Does that lead to some limit in terms of a time dilation uncertainty, or? Or you have some ideas how um, to resolve this? I don't this. think so, actually, because uh, things are, you may have uh, inhomogeneity, you may have uh, some gradients, but I characterize and benchmark them, and I only have to make sure they are constant in time. Okay. And fortunately, this uh, actual uh, gradients that I showed, they are super constant in time, at least at the level of 10 to minus 5, we could say that. Because they only depend really on the geometry of the iron trap, which mm -hmm. is constant. And then on the stability of the uh, electric voltages that you apply, and we stabilize them. So I would say at the 10 to minus 5 level, we can get this. But of course, uh, we're not just blindly counting on that. Uh, while we run the clock, we in situ have to measure micromotion. So during every detection cycle, we will also, we are doing photon correlation then uh, to measure constantly the micromotion if there's some drift over time okay. and eventually compensate. Hmm. Second is just a very quick, you know, you, you mentioned you have improved the Valadin's result uh, by this isotope shift measurement by a factor of 100. So you know, there is a tension, right? There's a, you know, King's plot is no longer linear. Um, are you consistent with the Valadin's result? And if yes, what mm. are you, as you mentioned, there's a lot of nuclear physics that probably one needs to understand. Uh, can you comment on that? Because um, yeah, Valadin sure. was already discovering some Nonlinearity in his, in his King's plot. Slide. So these are our measurement compared to Vladan's. This is the direct linear King plot on the uh, quadrupole and on the octopole transition. Here quadrupole, here octopole. Uh, on the octopole transition, we agree within the arrow bars pretty well with Vladan's measurements. So blue is us and, and black is Vladan. On the quadrupole, we had seen some deviations uh, way outside the arrow bars. But we discussed it with Ladan. We had several uh, video meetings with him. 
and actually they fixed it. Uh, the problem was that they don't have a fixed reference, so they had to predict the drift of the ULE cavity, and every time when you uh, ch jump from isotope to isotope and lock again, they had different rest amplitude modulation, and that gave uh, an offset. Uh, so uh, he repeated his measurements now, and now he agrees with our values. Um, so this is very good, so we both agree. Um, so now it, it comes about this generalized king plot. And the problem is really now, um, Julian Berengut always calls it the spurions. So uh, how many of these unknown guys here can you reject? You, this is the classical linear king plot. But then you have, uh, I mean, this is the new physics we're searching for, the fifth force that is really uh, coupling uh, to these neutrons. Um, but then there are also possible nonlinear contributions like the seltzer moments, R to the four. This is basically a nuclear shape. Uh, and also the quadratic field shift. Uh, and uh, a lot of it re uh, relies on atomic structure calculations and understanding of, uh, well, nuclear shapes and atomic shapes. Uh, so the problem that we're seeing now when we compare with Ladan, I mean, in principle, we agree with him that we really have a huge, um, actually we've seen our 86 sigma signal, that we have a second source of nonlinearity. Uh, we really, pff, we, we completely agree with him and it's even more significant. And we could nail it down that it's probably really now the Seltzer moment. So we got some new uh, calculations from Achim Schwenk at, at GSI who was doing this R to the four values. And it seems to agree extremely well. Um, so yeah, the, the, the problem is now we, we need one more isotope. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, but unfortunately it's radioactive. So we only have to can do it in as I sold it also. Or we can tackle the hyperfine structure one day if we could ever take uh, odd isotopes, but that's also an a nuisance from the atomic uh, physics side. But the problem is if you have, we have um, five isotopes, so we have four pairs, then we need three uh, transitions to compare in this generalized king plots, but then we can only reject two of these nonlinearities. And probably we have, checked, we have to reject both of them, so we're still blind to the other one. We need more isotopes. And this is, uh, at the moment, I think we're just doing nuclear physics. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Tanya, regarding the, the nice Lorentz symmetry measurements, I was curious, like you showed this dark time, effective Ramsey dark time of 2.5 seconds. Um, mm. You probably tried to push further. I, I wonder what was limiting you to the 2.5 seconds was it residual um, magnetic field that didn't perfectly get cancelled? No, it's, it's probably the old Powell's box that we are using. We have this old DDS stack that has some intrinsic limitations to do the pulses. Now we're switching to the Sonara hardware on Arctic. And I think with this we have done a better control. So it was really the stability of the pulses. It was a very technical problem um, that was limit, the limiting us back then. So um, I think if we could really push on that uh, in the future if we have a better RF pulse control. And very quick, out of curiosity, like so with these multi ensemble, like with these multi ion ensembles, is it in terms of micro motion? I mean, you, you showed that you can control it very well, but I wonder, isn't it tempting to think about some hybrid scenario where you get strong confinement electric field wise along one axis and then maybe tweezers or something like this for the other dimensions? Is, is that something you consider? <clears throat> no, yeah, okay. I mean, tweezers means another high power laser and I'm always a bit, uh, <laughs> uh, you need the single ion addressing over many, uh, several ions, they're really far away. Uh, I wonder if it's so scalable. Maybe uh, it's a technical challenge. Uh, so far, we're rather happy with the ion trap, how it works and we didn't see a, really a problem in there, you know. The, the problem is really the detection. This is uh, when you do an analysis, uh, what are the big hurdles for multi-ion clocks? Uh, you need uh, a good way to image them Im uh, immediately because these are big clouds. You know, the ions, they repel each other. We have distances of five to 10 micrometers. We have big objects and how to image it. So we have actually built a new ion trap with integrated micro lenses where we want to image now all five uh, clocks simultaneously. That was a project with industry. Once this will run, uh, that will be really a game changer. Um, and for the very long time, we're, we're right now working on a SPAD array that uh, is a bit shielded behind the Fresnel lens. 
when, when you image it there. So this is my biggest concern, how to really have it, uh, this, it, it's really like if you want to build a quantum computer, how do you get this repelling ions under control immediately? All, all the gradients we have seen, they were very stable in time, I'm not worried at all. And also the time dilation, thanks, I mean, in indium it's really nice because just by kind of a, a intermediate cooling, we get to the quantum mechanical ground state. It's like uh, you have uh, 360 kilohertz line width. So um, you, you sense a little bit the, the side bands, but they also overlap. It's like an intermediate regime. And we simulated now with Oleg Brutnikov, we had some paper this year. You really get a, a very good part in the ground state, and then you're at the 10 to minus 20 level of time dilation. I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> Thank you for a great talk. I was very excited to see this 1,000 ion 2D trap. Could you elaborate a little bit what's the status of this? Has it already been built? And if so, do you expect it to be that low micromotion as, uh, as your 1D? Um, in, in principle, yes. I think micromotion we can control with these um, integrated traps. I'm more worried about uh, anomalous heating yeah, because um, so I don't know if I... <laughs> A slide here to show you. I gave a talk last week at the Quantum Foundry, and now I kicked out these slides. Uh, so you see, this is how it looks. Um, so this it's is really kindergarten, and, and the, the problem is uh, that you integrate these uh, break couplers, um, so out couplers, because you, uh, you deliver the light here to the iron. Um, but then you really deform here uh, the, the electric fields. And so we simulated that, probably we should publish it soon. There you also have to obey the symmetries because you're completely right, Mariana. Uh, if you have a hole here, uh, you completely cause new micromotion, right? So we, we have to simulate it and compensate it by symmetries. And then it's, uh, of course, a different way, whether it's in the ground or whether it's in the RF. Then it's the ITO coding on it where you try to uh, short it again. Uh, but still, uh, it's a bit of a worry what will be the um, anomalous heating on top of these break couplers, we have to see. And typically in this type of traps, the ions get a bit closer to the surface. So we design right now such a sandwich trap where we're between three and 400 micrometers away. So not super close, not like a quantum computer because it scales with d to the four. So we want to be a bit further away. Um, I think, again, it will be even more uh, rigid and uh, reproducible because here nothing is changing anymore. You see everything is monolithic, integrated in the iron trap, including the detection. So we have to benchmark it once and, and then it's a really, you can shake it, the sensor will not change anymore. This is a nice thing. We even have tried to integrate here a very crazy outcoupler. This is, um, what does it show it? It's a Hermit Gauss mode. Yeah, because the octopole you can excite uh, with the curvature of the field, but the iron has to be exactly at the nodal line, which is very hard. So you have to hit the iron within a micrometer. And in free space, it's difficult to get. But if you integrate it in such an iron trap where iron and, and laser are directly coupled, I think that could also work. But Thank you. Um, it, it will be a long way to go because the, the engineering is crazy. It took us two years to get this trap. And well, it's this very exciting. Thank you. I, I have just a very small curiosity question. Can, can you show back that uh, uh, graph of the tidal gauges in Europe? Ah. Because it looks like it's not random. I mean, I don't no, understand. No, it's political. <laughs> this is, uh... So it, it, it just clearly there is this north-south uh, kind of sort of shift. So. It's not the measurement error, it just, um, like, okay, I mean, I, I all can of it tell you, Marianne, okay. this is sometimes so simple things that make our life hard. When you, uh, I mean, this area, Braunschweig, is very good. There we have really the one centimeter geoid. Uh, Heiner Denker is doing that. He's leveling between Poland, France, and this is under fantastic control. Also, thanks to Gauss. Gauss is the son of Braunschweig. He started the triangulation up to the Northern Sea, and this spirit continues in our uh, uh, city. But then when you go across borders, you see how the uncertainty is buckled up because the countries did not always easily exchange the height data and gravitational measurements. So you always have, because we have to integrate over this uh, force measurement to get the potential, and then it buckled up on the borders. And then even worse, uh, this is a fundamental problem also for, from nature, 
where, what is your reference? I mean, what is my height reference? So in the northern countries, we're taking this a tight gauge in Amsterdam here. And in the southern countries, we're taking the tight gauge in Marseille. And tight gauges means I have to know the sea level very well. But the sea level uh, depends on the salinity, on the ocean currents, the buoyancy, uh, on, on high and low tides. It's very difficult. And, and you see there are big uh, problems uh, to, to level the Mediterranean Sea to the Northern Sea. Um, so there are many, many problems, uh, po political-wise and also reference-wise. That's why I think the clocks are really the superior references. They don't care if you have this network. I'm just trying to understand. So the clocks, generally, if you put a clock at a tight gauge in Amsterdam and one in Marseille, you could sort out the difference, right? So yeah, that's I mean, kind that's of basic idea here? Hmm, sorry, sorry. So is the basic idea to put, say, one clock, portable clock, at the where the tight gauge in Amsterdam is and another one, say, in Marseille and find out is there a, like, just a shift because then it short, sorts out all the other shifts, it looks like, right? Yes, uh, or also come up with a complete new definition of the height system. I mean, since we have this European fiber network and we can really uh, connect London with Paris and Torino and Braunschweig, if politics pays for it, we also don't have a secured funding yet. Um, but this is really the way to go. And we have the National Metrology, uh, Metrology Institutes anyway providing time and they can really give you immediately the reference. Shimon was trying to, a very short question, uh, Shimon. Yeah, so uh, sorry to jump around, um, great talk, by the way. But so um, for the isotope shift measurements, so you mentioned that you need one more isotope. Would, would adding another transition? No, transitions or, don't help. We have more. plenty of transitions, yeah. yeah. We have more than enough because we also, I mean, uh, I didn't mention it, but in this uh, plot, uh, also the measurements of um, uh, Takahashi, uh, so I'm bad with names, Takahashi in Kyoto included in a neutral uh, ytterbium. Um, uh, so we have like four uh, lines already. But it's, when you do the mathematics, you always need one isotope pair more than the lines. So we have actually four lines and only four isotope pairs. We need a fifth one. And if you combine with other elements, I mean, like, yeah, 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 yeah. No, this is what we want to do. So we're, we're actually talking now in Europe about making a big collaboration and comparing barium, ethereum, strontium. Um, this will be the endeavor of the future, absolutely. Okay. Great. Thanks.